So, welcome to this conversation. Welcome, Eric Fischer. We are very glad to have you join us tonight. Um, my first question leads to the beginning of your career. Uh, actually, your first solo show in New York was in 1979. And back then, you showed um, a painting which is iconic, one could nearly say now, uh, with the title Sleepwalker. You saw a naked boy, rather clumsy, in a plastic lawn pool, and he's masturbating on my pee pool, who knows? And um, it's obviously the setting is uh, middle class suburbia. So that's something that was typical for your work in the 80s when you really got famous in the States. And that was something, the setting, that really hit the nerve at the time in the 80s in the States. Why? There was a, a circumstance uh, surrounding painting in the late 70s, uh, actually throughout the 70s, uh, the painting uh, was considered uh, uh, not a relevant media for the arts, it was considered dead. If you painted, they expected you to at least paint abstractly because that was more alive than figuration, which was really dead. And uh, what I found for myself was that I, I was a, not a good abstract painter, but you don't choose to be a painter. You just choose to be a better painter. That, it, that painting is a, it's a language and a way of processing information uh, uh, that's different than a photographer, that's different than a filmmaker, that's different than a sculptor, etc. So I found myself uh, to be a painter who needed to paint in order to understand the world. Painting was under assault. Uh, figurative narrative painting was under assault. And so I felt it safe uh, uh, if I could just paint what I knew, try not to paint bigger than what I knew. And I grew up in the suburbs, I grew up in an upper middle class suburban family, I grew up in a family that uh, had a lot of problems, uh, a lot of dysfunction. And so it was out of that uh, context that I began to paint. Now the suburbs was not considered a legitimate genre in art. It was, it was considered a wasteland. There was no creativity that could come from it. Um, but myself, my generation, we grew up in the suburbs. Ours was the first generation post-war to really grow up in the suburbs. And so we knew that there was a lot of content in the suburban life. And so I began with that. What you do is you kind of show what's happening behind closed doors. You show your uh, protagonists in awkward situations or even abusive situations or Embarrassing situations. Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, uh, you, you recently uh, published your autobiography, which is called Bad Boy, as Dr. Schroeder said already. Mm -hmm. And Bad Boy is also the title of an iconic painting um, of the 1980s, showing uh, a naked middle aged woman with spread legs and a uh, fully dressed boy who watches her. Again, you don't know if this is an abusive situation. He also steals something from her purse, obviously. So, um, was that the suburban middle class life uh, you got to know? Because you... <laughs> it was a... Uh, my, my paintings aren't specifically autobiographical with the exception of a painting I did of my mother's funeral. Uh, other than that, they're fictions. And, and as fiction, they're, they're constructed from uh, memories, from experience, from uh, things that 
other people have gone through the, you know, that I heard about, knew about, etc. Things I imagine, you know, kind of putting them into a context that, in a form that that uh, tries to get at some kind of uh, deeper truth. Um, what I was going for ultimately was a. Well, let's put it this way. You know, in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, one of the uh, things that was happening was a lot of uh, identity uh, politics. A lot of um, marginalized groups were seeking uh, equal representation. Uh, there were, you know, the feminists and, and uh, gays and, and blacks and Hispanics and, as I said, marginalized groups were trying to find their way into the power structure of the art world, which was dominated by males and was dominated by white males and was dominated by painting, essentially. So all of those things, painting, white, male, were under attack. And for a lot of good reasons, uh, but what it did was it it created a uh, crisis in terms of male identity. And so for me, the the thing was trying to find those moments that are specifically male. Those moments uh, which, it, in the early work, started with. Uh, a kind of dawning awareness of sexuality, uh, puberty, trying to figure that out. What is that in relationship to my body? What is that in relationship to my objects of desire? Where am I? How do I fulfill my need? How do I, uh, what is permitted? What is not permitted? Am I stealing looks? Am I, am I stealing uh, thoughts? Am I uh, doing something bad, good, etc. And, and so, within the context of Bad Boy, of course, all of those things are present. And, you know, the title Bad Boy it was for me an ironic title because, you know, I think that, that he's not a bad person. It's a normal situation, you know, given the context. Um, as you said already, there's, um, Lots of sexuality in the paintings, lots of naked bodies also. Never enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask if you have uh, the impression that the perception of your work in the States is different than in Europe. Did you? I, I think that uh, America is fundamentally puritanical, and uh, I think they have a, a, a lot of problems that surround sexuality and surround the body. Um, you know, it's, a, it, it's something that you notice when you go into museums that, you know, they, they tend not to have difficult work at, as part of their collection present in any way. Um, or I've had experiences where they've had to put signs up to warn people. <laughs> so, I, I would say on one hand, yes, that's, uh, that's certainly a, an aspect of it, but it's, it also seemed to me that it was an area to investigate, like a very fertile kind of ground to investigate, uh, because you could explore what it is about that, that is either justifiable or, or not justifiable at all. And, and so I pursued it on that level. The other thing is that I, I make a distinction between nude and naked. I, I'm not interested in nudity. I'm interested in naked. I, I, naked is, a, is people at their most exposed, their most vulnerable, uh, the most intimate. And it, and it has to do with revealing a relationship that they have with themselves, with their soul, with their bodies, and with their relationship to another. 
And it's, a, it's an absolutely dynamic and complicated arena in which we perform. And, and so it seemed like that's the, that's the place that you would find the greatest depth of material. Nude is, a, is a, an art uh, a form. It's a construction. It's an abstraction. It's about beauty and line and light and color and things like that. Uh, you know, formal aspects of composition. It's erotic rather than sexual. I'm interested more in sexual or sexuality, which is a, it's an identification, a self identification. It's not a simple uh, pleasure or desire, it's far more complicated. And uh, so that's why I looked into those areas. When you have fearful, something fearful and, and mysterious about it, and you also have a narrative abroad, really, so um, when you see this picture, you might think about what just what is about to happen or what just happened a second before. So there's always kind of story about it. It's sometimes these paintings are like a film still, really. So I wonder, um, is, uh, are any movies or a TV series a source of inspiration for you? Well, I, I grew up with uh, being exposed to television and to films and to photography long before I saw my first painting. And, uh, and so my uh, formation has a lot to do with those, with the way that media, uh, mediums, uh, kind of represent moments. Um, so I would, I would say I was, you know, in general, I was very influenced by film and, and uh, um, television. Uh, specifically, I was influenced by uh, movies like The Graduate uh, by Mike Nichols, which was uh, movies that take place in the 60s, uh, you know, very much within my generation, my time. Uh, I, was, I was influenced by uh, <laughs> It'll come to me tonight. Anyway, uh, I anyways many movies. Uh, you know, F Fellini movies were something that I always tried to figure out how I could possibly recreate a Fellini esque moment. For example, that that sense of humor, that sense of uh, compassion for the absurdity of humanity. That, that joy, that pleasure, that imaginative moment, that noise, things like that, you know, have always inspired me. So I think about that. And, and I, as, a, as an artist, uh, you know, my responsibility is to bring an audience into a moment that is full of meaning full of act, action that, that is, you know, has, a, has an electricity to it that gives, a, gives one who's looking at it the sense that uh, this is real, uh, that something has taken place before and something is taking place after the moment that I choose to bring you into that. Uh, the artistry is about finding exactly where that moment to stop it is. Uh, that's something that I've been trying to develop uh, my sensitivity to for the last 40 years of painting. It's like, where has it become the most, you know, triggered the most uh, uh, imagination, the most uh, feelings? Um, you studied art in the 1970s upon others at CalArts. In, in Southern California, which was actually founded by Walt Disney, a very famous art school. And um, you mentioned it before, back then in the 70s, um, minimal art, conceptual art was all the rage, but like painting was rather considered to be that, and figurative painting in particular. 
uh, was supposed to be really anachronistic. And nevertheless, you shifted into a figuration uh, from, I think you started as an abstract painter and then shifted into a figuration. So how did this exactly happen? Well, I was a... Uh, yeah, CalArts was, was a school that was uh, supposed to be the most advanced uh, art school of the time. It was a concept that was very interesting because it it put all of the arts together under one roof with this kind of free-flowing exchange that was supposed to, to happen. The trouble with painting is that it's a slow process of learning. It, it's not like photography or video, uh, which were very, you know, sort of important mediums at that time because uh, it takes a painter 10 years to even begin to master the craft of painting. Itself. So it's it's full of you know, just a lot of shitty paintings <laughs> in between that time. And a lot of faith. Faith and shit is what, <laughs> what being a painter, a young painter is, you know. And uh, and so I uh, as I, I had said earlier, I, I am a painter, so I persevered through a, essentially a negative education. Where I was told that I shouldn't be doing any of the things that I was doing. Uh, the good news is it made me stronger. The bad news is it was incredibly unpleasant. But uh, when I when I discovered, more importantly, that I wasn't a good abstract painter, you know, it created a crisis of what to do, and and uh, and then it was a, a process of several years of trying to find a, a language that was visual, that was painting, that I could, you know, do. And I started to uh, work with figures, I started to work with figures and language combined. Uh, and the, the, I was a very bad draftsman, so I was doing these kind of scratchy, expressive, but very bad drawings, and then I would, I, I believed in the words could carry greater weight than the image, so I would attach words to it as a way of sort of propelling it into a bigger moment. Uh, eventually, the, the words gave way, and, and I, part of it was that I discovered uh, this transparent paper, which you'll see in the exhibition, was this glassine paper. What was nice about this paper, and, and this is something I think artists all, all would readily agree, different materials unlock different parts of your imagination, different parts of your uh, expressive nature. <coughs> it's very important for artists to find exactly what that material is that does that. And, and I was fortunate to find this glassine paper which had a couple of qualities that I liked. One was that it could, it, it felt so good to smear oil paint on it because it was a, it would accept it very easily on the surface and, and then if you made a mistake you could wipe it off and there would just be a, a ghost of the image there but the paper would be intact. And the other was the transparency. And the transparency was important because what I found was that I could take a sheet of paper and I could put a chair on that sheet of paper. And then I would sit and I would ask myself in my studio, where is this chair? What room is this in? Is there somebody sitting in the chair? Are they standing next to the chair? Are they walking by the chair? And every time I would ask myself that, I'd get another piece of this transparent paper, lay it on top, draw what I thought might be there. Sometimes there was a person sitting in the chair and that was fine. Sometimes no, they aren't sitting. Get another piece of paper. Oh, they're walking by. And eventually I would add another, what else is there? Is there a dog in the room? Is there a lamp? Is there, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I would do that as well. And eventually I would end up with something that was a, a moment, uh, you know, a narrative moment. 
And so what I discovered by that was that I, one, the way I painted, the way I created, was that I talked to myself, and I told myself stories, and I projected meaning, and I projected images, and sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't, but I had to continually talk to myself in order to make it happen. And the, the other was that I, I could tell more stories using people than I ever could have told using squares and rectangles and, and uh, circles. And so it became clear to me that I was a, a figurative artist, a narrative painter, and then a, a progressive painter. And when you eventually really entered the, the art market in the late 70s and 80s, the market seems to, seemed to be really hungry for figurative painting, right? So there were well, first of all, you were, you were successful in the in the uh, back in the seventies and early eighties, it was still called the art world. Now it's called the art market. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yes, you talk about that in your autobiography. Yes, also. exactly. But the, uh, but yeah, that was the biggest surprise to me was the, that in fact the. the both the uh, press, the critics, curators, and, and uh, galleries and stuff were very receptive to this work. And uh, I had uh, no way of knowing that before it happened, but uh, very happy that it did. And maybe at this point it would be interesting to talk about your technique, because actually um, most of the time photography forms the basis of your paintings, but mm. not in a photorealistic way, so you don't project uh, blow-ups of photography on, on a canvas. Yeah. Um, what uh, role does photography play for you in your work? Uh, photography is absolutely essential to my work. It, it, as you said, forms the basis for it. I, I use uh, photographs uh, as a source material for not only paintings, uh, but my drawings, watercolors, sculptures, whatever. I'm not interested in photographic reality. I'm not interested in imitating the language of the photograph with one exception. And that is that the photograph has a way of slicing time so thinly that everybody in the picture is in motion. Every, everybody is off balance in a state of, of some kind of motion that is absolutely essential for creating a uh, believable narrative. You have to, you have to make it feel like this is happening as you are watching. And the photograph showed me the, the language, the body language that would enable that to happen. And so I became, uh, you know, wedded to it and obsessed and, and uh, you know, use it for everything. Uh, the other thing is, is that working with the, the configuration that I, I did coming at the time that I did, I, I had to reach very far back into art history in order to sort of pull the, the, the narrative, and the figurative narrative forward. I, ha I had to go back for myself, I had to go back to Manet, I had to go back to Degas uh, as, as sources for how to understand and work with uh, very specific problems that painting has. And uh, what Manet showed me was something that ph photography itself does. Black and white photography does this too. Which is give you an immediate sense that you're looking at something real. Even though it's completely abstract. Right? So black and white photograph, you look like, oh yeah, this really happened. But it's a language that doesn't exist in real life. Manet, if you look at his paintings, you, you 
know, you see a man and you, you walk right into the pain, you accept the reality of it. When you begin to look at how it creates reality, it's incredibly codified, incredibly abbreviated, uh, very much like a photograph. It's, you know, the, the shadows are schematic shadows, and, uh, you know, the, the, there's an ambiguity about deep space and flat space and things like that. So I, I looked at his work a lot for, you know, some way of connecting to that because I wanted that in my work. I wanted people to be inside my painting before they stood outside my painting and thought about it. Uh, I looked to Degas because Degas had a, such a profound psychological aspect to his compositions and to especially to his male gaze, right? The voyeurism of his uh, work was so profoundly charged with the complexity of desire and, and uh, you know, the ambivalence of that. And he found these amazing compositional ways that were also derived from the photograph as to how to, you know, uh, animate that uh, thing. So, I had to, on one hand, reach back to painters from the 19th century whose roots were also based in photography and pull that forward, trying to find a contemporary language that kept it alive or revivified it in some way. So, but how would this usually work? You, you just use snapshots or... Uh, I, I also heard that you recently worked with Photoshop, so you kind of rearrange pictures uh, using it as a source for your paintings. Yes, I, I, uh, uh, I work with uh, snapshots that I take. If I, if I don't have something I need, I look for somebody else who's got, got it and use that. Um, I was very reluctant for a long time to get into Photoshop, to get into the computer. Uh, thing because I thought it would take something away from my work and my wife, April, who's a, a landscape painter and who also uses photography and Photoshop, kept thinking I was an idiot because I was so reluctant to use this technique that was so helpful and, uh, and eventually she talked me into using Photoshop and, and it's been a miracle ever since because yes, the way I construct uh, things is through collaging. So before we talked about uh, middle class said earlier, which was the setting uh, you uh, often painted in the 1980s, uh, later on you got really interested into beach life so there are lots of beach pictures, really. Um, and I, I think uh, Saint-Tropez and the French Cotasseur um, was important for that. Mm -hmm. Would you like to tell us why? Uh, yeah, the, well, uh, the experience of, of uh, you know, the French beach was uh, one of um, where I was looking at naked people who were, whose body language was social. And it was that combination of, a, of social behavior uh, with their nakedness that was, for my American puritanical uh, that sensibility, shocking and compelling, right? And, uh, and so, uh, we, April and I would spend a lot of uh, years uh, going every summer to Saint-Tropez and to southern France and I would take a lot of photographs. Um, and those photographs that I took, the people in them wouldn't always be repainted in a beach. Because their body language is social, I could put them in a bedroom, I could put them in a kitchen, I could put them in a, around a pool, I could move them through other backgrounds and they, they would fit perfectly because it was there were naked people having social exchanges. 
and, uh, and so it was, a, it was a very rich material for me. And now the beach aspect of it is something that is a uh, It has a, a couple of meanings to me. One, one of course, is it's a, a, a place of pleasure. It's a place of relaxation. It's a place where people go to step outside of their daily lives in, in some way. And so it's a, it, it has that context to it, even though you see within that the people still within the context of pleasure, within the context of rest and relaxation are not necessarily still comfortable. So there's a, a nice conflict that takes place there that I can dramatize. The, the other thing is that it's, there's a, a level of it which is metaphoric for me. That is, it's, it's a boundary. It's a, it's a space on one side, the water, which is where we biologically have come from. And at the same time, can never return to. And on this side is the side we live on. And, and, it's, and we walk along that edge between where we've come from we can no longer get back to, and where we are now. And, and somehow those things have a large resonance for me. They, they talk about other aspects of some of these uh, beach paintings are really very big, so you really have a monumental scale, if one could say, which might be, you know, a counterpart to the maybe rather banal subject. Some people might say, no. mm -hmm. um, is this ironic that some of these beach, uh, beach pictures are really? Really monumental, big at least. Yeah, I think I mean, there's a probably several reasons for it, uh, for the monumental scale. One, is, one is I I find I'm a better draftsman working in where I can use my whole arm to paint and to draw. So that determines a certain size. Uh, the other is I'm competing with movies. So it, it has to achieve a, some level of a cinematic uh, scale, even though it's just painting. The other, the irony is, of, is in that it's, it's within the history of painting, it's a historical scale. But the subject inside it is, as you said, the man. So it's a, it's, it speaks to a certain absence within our lives, I think, uh, within my life anyway, between the, you know, what constitutes or how do you express the really important, the most important, how, what are the, you know, uh, anyone, yes. <laughs> I don't know where to go with that one. You, you also painted uh, famous friends or acquaintances of yours on the beach. For example, Steve Martin in shorts. Mm -hmm. um, and there was actually an, an exhibition in, in New York 2012 where you had lots of portraits of famous friends and uh, people you know, like Simone de Puri, the Swiss auctioneer, just people from the so called establishment, if you want to put it that way. Um, so, uh, you kind of shifted from the suburbs of middle class America to the playgrounds of the upper class. Why? Uh, the, um, true, true to my nature, I paint what I know. And I've always tried to stay within the context that I find myself. And so, my fame has brought me into the context of other famous people. These people that are famous that I know deserve to be famous. These are people who have contributed to our lives in profound ways. They've not only simply entertained us, but they've informed us, they've, they've nurtured us, they've given us a 
language and identity. What I found and realized years ago when I started to paint the portraits of the people that I know in my life was that these were significant people. They were people in the arts, they were writers and poets and musicians and, and actors and you know, other painters, etc. And so I, I feel that one of the responsibilities of an artist, of a painter, is to memorialize and to monumentalize their time. Whether it's in a, in a really important time or a not so important time, I think it's important that we monumentalize it and say this is this is that moment. And so, you know, within the tradition of painting, I'm, I'm doing nothing different than any painter has ever done, which is to paint the people that are the, uh, the power and the, and the integrity and, and the imagination of a culture. Uh, I, I choose to paint them in a, a, a less noble, way, which is to say an ordinary way, as just people in this world, in this moment, and, and they just happen to be on the beach in, in their shorts, <laughs> whatever. <coughs> but I don't think of it as like, you know, a political thing one way or the other. I don't think of it as like, a, you know, a decadence. Uh, I don't think of it as something that uh, you know, would have to be connected to some kind of Marxist political, you know, critique of the au bourgeois, etc., etc. I, I think the tradition of painting is so much bigger than the political critique that one should always see it in that context first. Talking about uh, political critique, actually you were a hippie once, right? But the lifestyle wasn't too appealing to you, I think. <laughs> I tried. I just was not very good at it. Yeah. Why? <laughs> you know, they, they... It was 1969 in San Francisco, right? Uh, 1967, 68. Oh, yeah, no, it was, it was the real time. Yeah. It was uh, uh, too many drugs. I was killing myself. Um, too much trying to uh, affect a, a lifestyle that I couldn't actually uh, believe in. I, f I found myself not really loving the people I was supposed to love. <laughs> so, you know, I, I just, I was not a good hit. <laughs> Um, you spoke at one point uh, talking about your portraits of memorizing history. You did that also um, regarding a very dreadful recent event in American history, which is 9-11. Mm -hmm. And uh, you actually uh, made a series, a body of works called Falling Figures, which are also in the show in Argentina and the sculpture, the so-called tumbling woman. And um, this sculpture and, and these watercolors, fallen figures, uh, actually memorize the people who jumped from the inferno of the burning Twin Towers, uh, which was, of course, a very disturbing moment because you could see people live on TV committing suicide, really. Um, when did you know that you want to uh, make a work for or about the victims, victims of 9-11? Mm -hmm. I knew the day that it was happening that artists were needed. I, I knew when I was looking at the tragedy unfold that this was such a terrifying, complicated, calamity that, that uh, artists were going to be 
necessary to help create language that we could use to deal with the trauma, to deal with the, uh, uh, the horror that was to follow. So I, I thought, you know, on that day I said I have to try to find a way to articulate some aspect of this. And uh, it took me about six months to arrive at uh, the image, the, the sculpture, this tumbling woman. Uh, which to me represented not, not simply the falling figures, but represented what happened to America after, which was that it, it, America lost its, its center, it lost its balance, and it began to kind of free fall, to roll along. And I had this image of a tumbleweed, you see in cowboy movies where the wind blows the sagebrush and it just goes and, and maybe it attaches itself briefly to something and then it rolls on and, and it felt like America was very much in that place of, of just this kind of motion, this lack of rooting and uh, you know being rooted uh, and stable. The, the thing about 9-11 which was different than I think most horrific dramas was that 3,000 people died in this moment and there were no bodies. So you, you had no way of, of understanding the human loss. And if you remember, I, I don't know if it happened here, but in, in America, the language of grieving quickly took the form of a loss of architecture. Everything was about the loss of the Twin Towers, the, the violation of the Twin Towers, the, 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 you know, the sadness. Of, they were talking about how to preserve the memory of the Twin Towers. Do you preserve the footprints? Do you send light up into the air that looks just like the ghost of the Twin Towers. Everything was about architecture, but the truth is, is that humanity was destroyed, or parts, you know, humans, I should say, was destroyed, 3,000 of them. So how to remember them? It's important to remember the humans, not to remember the building. And, uh, and so my, my sense was that these had to, this had to be a figure, this had to be something that represented both the, the, the vulnerability and the tragedy. Uh, I wanted it, uh, I felt that it was important to make it a female because I think the female still uh, holds the metaphoric position of both nurturer and vulnerable, uh, vulnerability. Uh, and I wanted that to be part of the experience. Of it. And, uh, and I also, I didn't want it to, as I said, be something that was just about falling and just about suicide or, you know, that, or death that way. I wanted it to be something that moved horizontally, that, that just kept going. So you said everybody was talking about the loss of the Twin Towers, right. this architectural loss. Because of course it's easier to cope with that, but you created that sculpture, Tumbling Woman, which was actually installed in 2002 in front of the Rockefeller Center to memorize the victims. And actually this really caused a scandal in New York. Why? It had, it had to be removed two days afterwards because uh, yeah, people were so yeah, it was, uh, it was very bad timing. I, I really thought that a year after the tragedy we would be able to begin the conversation, uh, begin the healing process in a, in a public way. But I was wrong. And uh, the... It also showed how 
disconnected art is from our daily lives. It showed me how disconnected art is from our daily lives. This is a, perhaps a very particular American thing, but the fact that they, the, the government, the, the churches, the, the uh, you know, civic leaders did not turn to their artists right away to say, help us reconstruct our lives through the arts, help us understand through the arts. You know, didn't go to the poets, didn't go to the musicians, the composers, the filmmakers, etc., etc., to say, help us find language to deal with this. The fact that when a work of art appeared in public, that was a sincere gesture for uh, dealing and confronting the pain and the horror and the, the tragedy of it, was met by the press and considered uh, as though I were trying to further my career by using suffering of other people to, to do that, showed me that, the, that there was this profound disconnect, a, a profound suspicion for art, which was further amplified by the fact that so many artists decided not to try to do anything to acknowledge this tragedy, did not stop the, the, the work in their studios to, to reflect on this moment that actually changed all of our lives. Uh, that they felt that it, their, their suffering should be private, that, their, uh, that the art was something separate from this public uh, tragedy. Also made me feel how disconnected art was from our more profound and basic needs. You actually talk about uh, this incident in your autobiography, the bad boy, mother of all of the con canvas. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it hurt you also a lot on the personal level that people thought of you as a cynical and that you are using the pain and suffering of others mm -hmm. to promote your mm -hmm. artistic career, basically. Yeah, that was, that was me. I mean, nobody likes to be misunderstood, right? And on this level, to be that profoundly misunderstood was very painful, yeah. So coming back to your autobiography, which was published last May. In this book, you don't only write about your personal career and your artistic approach, but it's, it really also offers a sharp critique of the art world's evolution, which becomes the art market at one point. Mm -hmm. um, how did the art world change since you started your career in the late 70s? Back in the late 60s, early 70s, fame and fortune were not connected to each other in art. That you could be famous but not wealthy. You could be part of the whole sort of lexicon uh, of, you know, modern art and, and still have two jobs. And, uh, and so part of the commitment that we made back then as young artists on art students was to be artists first and, and then see what happens. You know? uh, what began to change, began to change in the early 80s. We weren't aware of it in this. We didn't understand it. I don't think, I certainly didn't understand Understand what was about to happen and how much I was participating in what was going to happen. But as a generation, we believed that art could change the world. And the strategies for making art had to do, in, in a lot of cases, with trying to undermine or subvert the language of art. Uh, the values of art, etc., as a way of 
opening it up for a, a possibly new kind of, of art and, uh, and a new kind of relationship uh, to it. So we, we believed we were doing the right thing. And uh, at the same time we were doing that, there was another force that was coming in, which was that, this is very complicated, but I think it's true. You, you had all of the different styles of art making, all of the different marginal groups, the, 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 the identity questers, were all trying to come through the portal of, a, of what New York was, which was a very tight, very controlled art environment in the 70s that, that was painting dominated, male dominated, white dominated, it was, it was uh, anti-European, it was anti the rest of America. It was absolutely believed in its, uh, that New York was the center of the universe and, and you know, had a very s stringent sort of definition of what that was. It had a definition of what mainstream art was versus provincial, regional. Uh, and all of a sudden, this force came through a very narrow hole, you know, a crack in the wall that were you know, feminists and blacks and Hispanics and gays and you know all figurative painters and photographers and perform everything just came through European artists. The, the whole, the, all of a sudden, everybody's there. Now you have a, an art system, a gallery system, a museum system, a media system that was working on a whole different time. Right. Museums were taking two and three years to curate shows. Magazines were reviewing shows six months of out. Uh, galleries were working with a small stable of artists that made similar kinds of work. All of a sudden, it's like this floodgate opens, there's all different kinds of work. Nobody knows what good is, what bad is. It's, everyone's clamoring to try to figure out how to show and represent everything that's going on. Art criticism goes by the wayside because it can't keep up, because it, things are changing every week. Uh, curators become less important because they can't keep up with the constant thing that's changing. Galleries can't keep up with it. It's starting to have a rise of a different class of art uh, Authority, which is collectors, which are driving the market. You have art consultants instead of uh, curators. And you have daily journalists as opposed to scholars, to critics, who are, who are trying to, in the daily magazines and newspapers, they're trying to keep up with what's going on. So crit criticism is being re reduced to blurbs, right? Yeah, and needing to change quickly. So everything is shifting radically because of, of that, that thing. Also, because it was in the dailies, it was put in the entertainment section. And because it was in the entertainment section, it's in the same place that rock and roll stars and uh, celebrities are. So now artists are in a position where they're seen in the same context as celebrities, which is a big change. So all of these things were happening, and for those of us who were in it, we, we had no idea. We, it became a ride. You know, we, we were just like, woo! <laughs> this is amazing, look at this. I'm, I'm being driven around in a limousine. I'm, I'm like eating fancy restaurants, I, you know, it's like, it was absurd, it was funny, it was, you know, whatever, and nobody had any idea where it was going to go to. And of course, where it went to was at a, uh, 
It went into a speculative market. It went into an alternative currency. It went into a, a thing where people were, artists were changing to uh, meet their demands, so they were becoming producers on a mass scale. Uh, they were imitating factory systems as a way of marketing and manufacturing their products. I mean, it, you know, it just, everything changed, so. Recently, the, the art market also got a subject you're interested in. You started to capture scenes uh, from art fairs. So what you did is you took snapshots at uh, Art Basel, Miami Beach, I think. And uh, these pictures are, again, a source for your paintings. So an art fair, of course, for an artist is uh, very important due to economic reasons. But I wonder why is it an interesting subject for you? Uh, well, I, you know, first of all, I think it was the publishing of my memoir that gave me the courage to look more specifically at the art world uh, and to kind of confront that aspect of it. Um, the, uh, the thing about the art fair is that it's, it, it's, a, it, it's really not the place for art, but it has a lot of art in it. And by that, I mean, it, what it has in it is it has artists who are making objects that are, you know, talking about existence. They're, they're talking about things that mean something to us. They're, they're, they're oftentimes screaming about it. You know, they're, they're being, you know, crazy strange about it. They're being fabulous about it. They're being beautiful about it. But they're, they're really are trying to communicate something that is meaningful to us as people. But, this, but the structure of the art fair doesn't allow for that kind of experience. So what you see, and what I've been focusing on in my work, is that, that crazy space between the paintings. The, the fun part for me, by the way, is that I get to paint other people's art, which is tremendous. I often find that I start to paint something thinking I hate this artist. And then as I paint it, I think, wow, that was really smart. <laughs> you know, this is better than I thought it was. <laughs> anyway, that's just a personal note. But, uh, but the other thing is that you have this thing where you have the consciousness of the art world on one side of the, the people who are in between, who are negotiating sales or being glamorous or socializing or texting or, you know, whatever, in the middle. And, and then you have the audience on the other side and, and between the artist and the audience we're sandwiching this world where like the pressure is in this middle space, which is a strange place. And, and that's kind of what I'm exploring. The other thing that I found that was just you know, a side note for me was the space of an art, art fair is really complicated space because it's, it's small spaces that open up through narrow slits into other spaces. That, you, you see two and three worlds away. It's a, it's a space that is inherently a collage space, and within the structure of painting, it's an abstraction. And so, for me, uh, my paintings are changing compositionally to deal with this new kind of space, and I, I find that fun to paint. So. So we are excited to see lots of paintings uh, that capture these strange spaces of art fairs, art fairs in the future. Um, 
I think we stop at this point now. Um, the exhibition Eric Fisher, Friends, Lovers and Other Constellations will open tomorrow at 7 p.m. Thank you, Eric, for joining us tonight and thank you for your attention. Thank you.